Well, I would invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 for our message this morning, entitled, The Star Witness Testimony. Our text for today is John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34, which is the testimony of John the Baptist, who we're calling John the Witness, regarding his identity of the Messiah. As we've seen, the Gospel of John is like a courtroom drama where the Apostle John sets forth his case that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And his goal? It is that we would believe, and by believing, have life in his name. Now John doesn't tell us this until chapter 20, verses 31 to 30 and 31, but having said this, or having understood this, it helps us understand the underlying purpose behind everything that he writes throughout the whole gospel. And so last week we saw that after his opening arguments of verses 1 to 18 of chapter 1, John begins his gospel proper by calling to the stand John the Baptist, who is the star witness of his case. There will be other witnesses throughout this gospel, as we'll see. There will be much evidence put forth. But none is so prominent, none so articulate, none so significant as John. John the witness is the last of God's prophets before the coming of Jesus. And John's ministry is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, as we saw last week. And our text today tells us that the identity of the Christ was revealed by Jesus. Uh, to John by God himself. So John didn't come to his conclusions based on his own opinion, based on his own perspective or his life experience. No, he, he came to his understanding of who Jesus is because he was a prophet sent from God and God himself revealed to John the truth about Jesus. In our last day in court, if you will, we heard uh, in verses 29 or 19 to 28, the identity and the credibility of this star witness, John. That's how all witnesses start on the stand. They are asked to identify themselves and to explain what's their relationship with the defendant in some cases, or what's the relevance of their testimony in other cases. Uh, John is like a combination between an eyewitness and an expert witness because his very mission from God is to reveal the identity of the Messiah to the world. That's that's his vocation. That's his expertise. And his humility in doing so and doing nothing but pointing Jesus to the Messiah and away from himself is what makes his expert witness credible. But he's not just an independent expert who gives his opinion on matters in general. His testimony is based on what he saw with his own eyes. And there is perhaps no stronger testimony than an expert eyewitness. Now, as the court begins its second day of testimony, John gives us four truths about Jesus that confirm that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And the necessary result of this testimony, my friends, is that you and I would believe in Jesus. That that call to believe in Jesus is certainly directly made to you whoever you are, who have not yet believed in Jesus, who have not yet trusted in Him for the forgiveness of your sins. But it also comes to us who have already come here this morning believing in Jesus. We'll see that as we close. Well, let's read the passage and then we'll dig into John's testimony. Follow along as I read verses 29 to 34. The next day, he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, or he testified, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, 
He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. With the opening words of this passage, the next day, we're given a timestamp that puts John's testimony in the context of other events. Rather obviously, this would mean that this text, this, the events of this, uh, of this passage happened the day after the event of verses 29, 19 to 28, where John gave answers. He responded to the questions of religious leaders from Jerusalem. But to to take note of the fact that not only in verse 29 does he say the next day, but in verse 35, it also begins the next day. And then in verse 43, it says again, the next day. And then chapter 2, verse 1 opens on the third day. This tells us that chapter 1, verses 19, all the way through chapter 2, verse 12, covers roughly a week's span of time, perhaps about eight days. Uh, The Apostle John doesn't tell us where this particular week falls in the timeline of Jesus' life and ministry because that's not pertinent to his case, but it certainly raises our curiosity, especially since we have all four Gospels of the account of the life of Christ. Well, what we read here in verses 29 to 34 is not the occasion of the baptism of Jesus. This is not the first time that John the Witness has had an encounter with Jesus. Based on what Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us about the baptism of Jesus, verses 32 and 33 speak of what happened at the baptism of Jesus in the past. Well, so if if this isn't the baptism of Jesus, when did Jesus get baptized? When did John, as he says, as it says in verse 29, when did John see Jesus coming to him? What's the relationship between those two events? Well, as you think about what the Gospels tell us in Matthew chapter 3 and in Luke chapter uh, 3, we are told that after Jesus was baptized, the Spirit led him off into the wilderness. And there he was in the wilderness for 40 days, fasting, preparing himself for the ministry that God had entrusted to him. At the end of those 40 days, when he was extremely weak, physically vulnerable, and because of that spiritually vulnerable, the devil, his adversary, came to him to try and end his ministry before it even began. Well, after successfully resisting that temptation, Jesus was so weak, Scripture says, that angels had to come and minister to him. And I take that to mean that they came to feed him and help him regain his strength. After that period of time, whatever it was, both Matthew and Luke record that Jesus returned to Galilee. The wilderness is in the south, Galilee is in the north. Galilee is the region where Jesus and his family lived. And so if you piece together the four Gospels, in the first few weeks of Jesus' time in Galilee, Jesus calls his disciples, we'll start to see that next week, He and his family and his disciples attend a wedding in Cana, which is also in Galilee. And then Jesus moves his family from Nazareth, which is about in the middle between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee, to Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee. All of those things take place in the the first few weeks uh, of Jesus' ministry. The events then that we read here in John 1 occur as Jesus is traveling from the wilderness where he had been tempted by the devil, and as he makes his way back up to the north, uh, to Galilee, he stops along the way, as it were, to, to see John and to have himself be revealed publicly by the apostle or by, the, uh, by John the Baptist. So by that point, it had been well over a month since John the Baptist had seen Jesus. At least 40 days, perhaps even several months, depending on how long it took Jesus to regain his strength after fasting in the wilderness. As you look at verse 29, all of our Bibles put the verbs in the past tense. But in the Greek, they're actually in the present tense, and that's intended to to give a a vivid portrayal. It's, It's as if John the Apostle says to John the Baptist on the witness stand, now John... 
take us back to that day and tell us what you saw. And it's as if John were to say, I see Jesus coming toward me and I say, behold. The word behold here is simply an exclamation to alert the listener. And a speaker would not just say behold, but they would point in the direction of what they are wanting to direct the attention to. Uh, This word is used many times and it's often translated, look, see. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 26, John the Baptist and his disciples are on one side of the Jordan and Jesus and his disciples are on the other side of the Jordan and his disciples, or John's disciples say, look, he whom you baptized is baptizing others and all are going to him. Well, in our text, when John sees Jesus coming to him, he, he points to him and says, behold, Look. And then he gives his testimony. His testimony, given in our text, is four truths about Jesus that confirm that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Consider the first truth. The first truth that John proclaims is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Look again at verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. It's hard for us to appreciate the significance of this language because it's so familiar to us, but I want you to try to appreciate its significance from John's perspective and the people around him. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has done no miracles. Jesus has not taught anything to anyone. He hasn't preached any sermons. No one knows who Jesus is. And as Jesus is walking along the Jordan amidst the perhaps thousands, if not hundreds, if not thousands of people who are going to hear John preach and be baptized by John, there was nothing about Jesus that made him stand out in the crowd. As far as anyone knew, Jesus was just another man along the way going to hear John preach and be baptized by him. And so for John, who everyone knew rightly to be a prophet, for John to to point to someone in the crowd and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a shocking declaration. It's one of those moments that's seared into the mind of those who heard it. And in the years to come, they would share the story with their friends and family of, I was there that day when John made the first declaration about the Messiah. In the moment, though, the people were probably confused. What does he mean? Lamb of God. What does it mean that he takes away the sin of the world? What is he talking about? You see, this is not language that comes immediately and directly from the Old Testament, at least in terms of the quotation of it. They had never heard their rabbis say anything to them about some coming Lamb of God. And the idea of taking away the sin of the world was not something that they were familiar with from their teaching of the Old Testament. So where did John get this language? What is he talking about? Well, again, John is a prophet. He received direct revelation from God. So in this declaration, John is not merely rehearsing or repeating what the Old Testament says. As a prophet, he is speaking a word from God. And the Lord revealed something through John that they were not expecting. But as is the case with all new revelation from God, it's completely consistent with what God had already revealed in Scripture. And so to understand where, what John means here, we have to start with the fact that lambs were one of the most common animal used for sacrifice. We're familiar with that. And that goes back well over 2,000 years from John's perspective. You remember that in Genesis 22, when Abraham and Isaac were making their way to the mountain where Isaac was commanded to sacrifice Isaac, where Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac, as they were getting close, Isaac made this observation. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Do you remember Abraham's response? He said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Well, in that moment, Abraham was not prophesying about the coming Messiah. He was himself trusting the Lord in that moment for that particular situation. But but he does 
pluck the scarlet thread that runs throughout Scripture about God's redemptive plan to save his people from their sin. Another time that that scarlet thread is plucked is in Exodus chapter 12, just before the Lord redeems his people out of Egypt. Before that final plague, the Lord gives this instruction to Moses. Tell all of the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a a lamb for a household, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they eat it. The, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." Now, in many places, the Bible draws a direct connection between God's redemption of his people out of Egypt and God's redemption of his people from sin. And we even have sitting before us an example of that connection. The sacrificial lamb at Passover is the central element because it's what prevents the people of God from receiving the same condemnation and judgment that the Egyptians received. Well, there are many passages throughout the Old Testament that would direct us in the attention of, uh, in the direction of a sacrifice. But for the sake of time, I want to take you just to one more, and that is Isaiah 53. And in fact, I would encourage you to put your finger here and turn over with me to Isaiah 53. I know it's familiar, but this is a good uh, meditation to consider, especially as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Isaiah 53, of course, is the great chapter which ought to have given the people of Israel the expectation that the Messiah would be put to death and pay the the penalty of sin. And this passage, though we think of Isaiah 53 as a chapter, it really begins in chapter 52, verse 13. Look there, it says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. That's how it begins. And then look at chapter 53, verse 12, to see how it comes to an end. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. So this passage begins and it ends with triumph. Isaiah 53 cries out, victory! But that victory comes at a cost. Look again at verse 12. He goes on to say, Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The victorious servant of the Lord achieved victory not by dealing out death, but by being put to death. He didn't receive a crown standing on the slain, but by being slain. He bore the sins of many, it says, and and in bearing their sin, he accepted the penalty of death that is due to sin. Look over at verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The servant of the Lord did not die for his own sin. He sacrificed himself for, the transgress- for our transgressions and our iniquities. And then we see the, the language of sacrifice in verse 10, where it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. T- he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. The Mosaic law has many kinds of offerings and sacrifices for different reasons. And there are different animals prescribed for different occasions, depending on what the Lord chose to prescribe. But bulls, goats, rams, lambs, turtle doves, and pigeons are the most common animals that are prescribed. What kind of animal sacrifice was the servant of the Lord? Well, the closest we get to an answer is in verse 7. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, 
And like a sheep that is that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now be careful with the language here. It, Isaiah is not saying that the servant of the Lord is a lamb. He's saying that he is like a lamb in the silence with which he took his death. That's about as close as the Old Testament gets to describing the coming deliverer as the lamb of God. But the second part of John's statement there in John 1, who, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that's much clearer in this passage of Scripture. Look again at verse 5. He says, But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 6. Second half of verse 6. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And then the end of verse 8. He was cut out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people. Again, verse 12, he bore the sin of many. Those are all ways of expressing the fact that in, the, the servant of the Lord, the, the coming deliverer, takes upon himself the sins of others. And in taking their sin from them, there is no longer any sin on them. And do you know, do you know what you call someone who has no sin? Righteous. Look at verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. If I can throw a New Testament passage here. This is the same truth as 2 Corinthians 5.12 where it says, For our sake He made Him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteous, which is to say the sinless one, the righteous servant of the Lord, bore the iniquity of many so that the many could become righteous. He, he takes their sin upon Himself such that, the, such that God can declare them to be righteous. Well, coming back to our text, through divine revelation, the prophet John pulls together the scarlet threads running throughout the Old Testament and sees them all terminate on Jesus. And he declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Maybe you're wondering about that last part. He takes away the sin of the world. Does, does that mean that everyone becomes righteous? No, the, the word world is here used categorically, not exhaustively. It means to refer to mankind without distinction, not mankind without exception. I think a helpful passage to understand this principle is 1 John 4. 14, where it says, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And what the Apostle John means there is that the, Jesus is the only Savior that the world has, not that He is the Savior of every person in the world. So to say that Jesus takes away the sin of the world is to say that anyone in the world who believes in Jesus can have their sin taken away. Even as it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that, that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever, whoever would believe would not perish but have eternal life. This is the work of Christ on our behalf. Yes, part of his work is and will be to establish his kingdom on the earth. But first, the first order of business was to take from among his enemies, those who deserve his wrath, some, even many, whose sin he would remove from them so that they would be his people. John the Witness makes this first declaration about Jesus, and that confirms that Jesus is the Christ. And then he goes on in the same breath to to make a second declaration to all those who were standing around looking at Jesus. And his second declaration is that Jesus existed before John. Look at verse 30. He says, This is He of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because He was before me. John, excuse me, Jesus existed 
before John. And yet he says Jesus came after John. Now he has to declare this because if anyone knew the Gospel of Luke, they would have known that John was somewhere in the neighborhood of six to nine months older than Jesus. In fact, uh, closer to three months older than Jesus. But now, 30 years later, there would have been no way to visibly look at the two men and see which one was older. And so these people who are around, they're hearing John the Baptist proclaim Jesus, and he has to tell them, Jesus came after me. I'm older than Jesus. But Jesus existed before me. He was before me, he says. Now, I touched on this when we looked at verses 14 to 18, because Uh, This statement is quoted also in verse 15. And the context there, remember, is that uh, John the Apostle is making the connection that Jesus is the very God of Exodus 34, who revealed himself as the God of steadfast love and faithfulness, which John refers to as grace and truth. And and he's declaring that Jesus is God. He pre-existed John the Baptist. And, And here... Following up the declaration that Jesus is the Lamb of God, John the Baptist declares that Jesus is not one whom God created to come and be the final sacrifice, but rather Jesus existed before He was born. Now I remind you, in in this culture, they thought of age in terms of rank, not strictly in the military sense, but in the sense that those who were older, even if just a few months, were more deserving of honor and respect and deference and even to some degree authority. And remember that Jesus used this cultural ethic to confuse the Pharisees about the Messiah. In Matthew 22, Jesus said to them, how is it that David in the spirit calls the Christ Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And the Pharisees couldn't come up with a rational explanation as to how David's son could be called Lord by David because the son should always call the father Lord, not the other way around. Well, in a similar way, John the Baptist is here saying that Jesus ranks higher than him because Jesus existed before him, even though he happened to be born after him. Well, by declaring the pre-existence of Jesus, John effectively asserts the deity of Jesus, especially when you combine that with the testimony at the end of verse 34, which will come to that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, a question one could ask is, how did John know that Jesus existed before him? Again, the answer is divine revelation. Look at verse 31. He says, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Note that not only there does he say, I myself did not know him, but he says it again in verse 33. Now on the surface, this is puzzling to us. Based on what the other gospels reveal about the relationship between Jesus and John, is this really true? Is it possible that the mother's who were relatives, would never introduce their sons to one another? I mean, it would seem difficult to consider that the angel Gabriel revealed to Zechariah and Elizabeth that your son, John, is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And then Gabriel goes to Mary and says, your son is going to be the Messiah. And then these two mothers come together for several months while both boys are in the womb. And then they, once they depart, they never see each other again. Is that even possible? In fact, remember that when Jesus first came to John to be baptized, John said to him, I need to be baptized by you, and and yet you come to me? Wouldn't that mean that John knew not only who Jesus was as a relative, but that he knew that he was the Messiah? So what does he mean here? I myself did not know him. Well, the answer is not found in some kind of nuance in the Greek language of some type of knowing. Now, the answer is found in the larger theme in the Gospel of John that I haven't touched on yet because it hasn't come up, and I'll only address it for a moment, and then we'll continue to consider it as we move through the Gospel. In this Gospel, the Apostle John gives significant attention to the idea of knowing Christ. What does it mean 
to know Christ. This begins all the way back in verse 10 of chapter 1 when he says that the world did not know him. And then it comes up again when John says in verse 26, as he speaks to the religious leaders, there's one among you whom you do not know. If you do a simple word search for the word know in the Gospel of John, you'll find that it comes up nearly a hundred times. 99, in fact, and that's more than all three other Gospels combined. Knowing the truth about Jesus is a significant theme of, of this book, but the issue is not intellectual knowledge such that in your ignorance, if somebody just speaks a word about who Jesus is, now you've gone from not knowing to knowing. Rather, the issue the Apostle John emphasizes throughout the book is that one has received or must receive divine revelation, not in a prophetic sense, but in the sense that God has opened your eyes and the mind of a person to know and believe in Jesus. Here's how this applies to what John is saying here. When, when John says that he did not know Jesus, what he means is that he did not have intrinsic knowledge of him based on personal life experience or his personal relationship with him. That was, that was not the basis of his knowledge of Jesus. Rather, he, he knew Jesus Christ on the basis of divine revelation. It's true that like John likely could have said, oh, I know Jesus. He's my second cousin or whatever their actual relationship was. But he didn't. Why? Because he didn't want his testimony of the Messiah to be based on personal subjective opinion. His testimony of Jesus as the Messiah was, was not based on what his parents told him. It wasn't based on any interaction that he and Jesus may have had when they were little. No, his testimony is based on undeniable divine revelation. And we know this because this is what he says in verses 32 and 33. John, it says, bore witness. He testified. This is the divine revelation. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptized with, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John's ministry of baptism was the God-ordained means by which the Lord would confirm the identity of Jesus to John personally, that's verses 32 and 33, as well as give John the platform to broadcast the identity of Jesus to the nation of Israel. That's verse 29 to 30. Again, he says there in verse 31, For this purpose I came baptizing with water that he may be revealed to Israel. In prophesying the Messiah in the, throughout the Old Testament, the Lord didn't give any particular indication of what that revealing of the Messiah would look like, except that it would come through the ministry of the forerunner. The prophets of old, as you recall, were proclaimers. They would receive a revelation from God and they would proclaim it to the people and ultimately write it down for the benefit of, of the ages. Uh, they were calling the covenant people of God to return to the Lord through obedience to the law. And in the course of their ministry, they were itinerant, itinerant. They would go from place to place, going to the people or to the individual, whomever the message was for, they would travel. John was a proclaimer as well, but John wasn't itinerant. He lived in the wilderness and his ministry was centered in the wilderness. And as well, his ministry was not just a proclamation message. It was a call to the people to demonstrate their submission and repentance by the act of baptism. That's why he needed to be by the Jordan. So the people had to come to John, not just to hear the message that he proclaimed, but also to receive the baptism that he was doing. This was designed by God. So that when it was time for Jesus to be revealed publicly, large masses of people from throughout Israel would already be gathered listening to the forerunner. And then those masses would then take the message from the forerunner and deliver it to the rest of the nation. 
the proclamation of John filled the air with the expectation of the coming Messiah, and then now of the Messiah who had finally arrived. This is why, by the way, it didn't take very long before Jesus couldn't enter into towns because the crowds very quickly latched on to who he was and there were so many people around he couldn't get into the cities. Now, there were still questions among the people. There was not a little debate of who Jesus was, but the general population was more than ready to receive Jesus as the Messiah and to make him king. We'll see that in chapter 6. So verse 31 here tells us that the purpose of John's ministry of baptism was to reveal the Christ. And then verses 32 and 33, we see that John's ministry of baptism is what the Lord used to confirm the identity of Jesus. Look at it again. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with water the Holy Spirit. Here, John tells us what he saw when he baptized Jesus. Let me remind you of the accounts of Jesus' baptism. Matthew 3 says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up from the water and behold, the the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give the same testimony. Now the words in our text are not John the Apostle telling us what happened. They are John the Baptist declaring to everyone around him what he saw when Jesus was baptized. And what, as, as he describes what happened, the, he also adds that the Lord had previously revealed to him, this is what you should be looking for to identify the Christ. What was he to be looking for? What would help him identify The Messiah, what did he see after Jesus was baptized? Well, I'll tell you what he did not see. He didn't see a dove. Often when you see pictures or some kind of portrayal of the scene of the baptism of Jesus, you'll see a dove hovering above Jesus. But John didn't say that he saw a dove. He says he saw the Spirit descend like a dove. In other words, he he didn't see the form of a dove. He he saw some spiritual essence descend and come upon Jesus in, in in a gentle way. That's how a dove descends and lands. Now, perhaps someone could say, well, isn't that how all birds descend and land? I don't know of any birds that crash land. Do you? So in, why does John here say that it was like a dove? Why does he specify that particular bird? Well, many birds, of course, have similar qualities. But there's something about our common perception, and this seems to be universal across cultures, that when we think of a dove in particular, we think of gentleness. And this overlaps with what Jesus says in his instruction to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Innocence and gentleness are not the same, but... There is a commonality between those two characteristics. The point is that the Spirit did not come down like fire from heaven, as many pray or sing today. Spirit, come as fire. Nor did He come down like a hawk grabbing onto Jesus like a prey. No, He came down a smooth and gentle descent. What the Spirit actually looked like, we don't know. John doesn't say, but whatever He saw... It was not visible to anyone else except Jesus. The other Gospels say Jesus saw it. Here we see that John saw it too. Like like Balaam's donkey who saw the angel in front of him. And it was only him who saw it until the Lord opened Balaam's eyes to see the angel. Or like Elisha who saw armies of angels surrounding him until he prayed for his servant to also see those armies of angels. Here, with God-enabled vision, John saw the Spirit descend, and no one else had this vision. This is what the Lord told him to be looking for, and this is what he saw when Jesus came out of the water. 
Well, as he recounts what he saw, he tells us, he adds a third truth about Jesus, that Jesus is the Lamb of God first, he says, and then he testifies that Jesus existed before him. Third, he says that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Did you notice at the end of verse 33? This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now that's revelation he received from God, but he's now declaring that to the people around him. Here, John uses not the personal pronoun as if to say he is the one, but the demonstrative pronoun, this is the one. Mark 1 tells us that one of the messages that John would give to everybody he baptized is this, I have baptized you with water, but he, referring to the Messiah, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That was a That was a a teaching, that was a proclamation that John would make. And here John is saying, you know the one that I've been telling you about who would baptize you with the Holy Spirit? This is him, the Lamb of God, the one who existed before me. He is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. In saying that Jesus is the Lamb of God, John testifies to the redemptive work of Christ. In saying that Jesus existed before him, he testifies to the deity of Christ. And here, in testifying that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, he testifies, listen, to the new covenant fulfillment of Jesus. He testifies to the new covenant fulfillment of Jesus. Now, we know that there are many in the world today who have formulated a theology of baptism of the Holy Spirit that go far beyond Scripture. There are some who say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something you experience sometime after salvation that gives a believer some unique spiritual empowerment. There are some who say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit always manifests itself in speaking in tongues. There are some who say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that a believer can experience many times because it's temporary and so it can happen and then the Spirit goes away and then he gets the Spirit again. Well, the Scripture doesn't teach any of those ideas and others like them. Of course, we could do a whole message on what it means to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, what it isn't and what it is. But since the teaching of the Spirit is also another significant theme throughout the Gospel of John, for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you what it is, how it relates to the new covenant, and then we'll come across, as we come across the teaching of the Spirit, we'll cover that throughout the Gospel. Here's what it is. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of God whereby he sends his Holy Spirit to indwell a person at the moment of salvation. That's it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of God whereby he sends his Holy Spirit to indwell a person at the moment of salvation. To baptize means to immerse. And when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in a person's life, That indwelling is not limited to a a closet or a room or a floor of the house. No, his presence permeates the, the entire life. But listen, the Holy Spirit is not a substance such that through the use of spiritual gifts or power or sin or some other means that the Spirit can be depleted in a person's life and therefore they need to be refilled and rebaptized. No, rather, the the Spirit is a person. He is a person who is personally present and he exercises rule over a person's life. So to be full of the Holy Spirit means to be fully controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, last week we noted that the first element of the new covenant is a sprinkling with water, a washing, a cleansing. And that's what may have given rise to the expectation that the Messiah would baptize his people. But here's another element of the new covenant in Ezekiel 36. Technically, it's the third one that's listed. And I, he says, the Lord, the Lord says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's the new covenant promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit who will enable and empower obedience in the lives of believers. The work of Jesus the Christ 
is to inaugurate the new covenant such that believers receive the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get to the upper room discourse in John 14 to 16, we'll, we'll have the blessing of doing an extended study on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. But for now, John's testimony is that Jesus activates, inaugurates the new covenant promise of the Holy Spirit, which further confirms that he is the Christ. Well, the final truth about Jesus to which John testifies is that he is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. We'll just consider this quickly. Look at verse 34. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. All that we've read here, verses 29 to 34, is the declaration of John the Baptist to those crowds around him when he saw Jesus coming to him. And so having testified that Jesus is the Lamb of God, having testified that Jesus existed before him and that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, John concludes his testimony with the pronouncement that this is the Son of God. Now that language, Son of God, that title, I should say, you won't find in the Old Testament. You won't be able to do a search on Son of God and find anything in the Old Testament. But what you do find is the Messiah is the Son of God. And you find that in two significant texts. The first is 2 Samuel 7, which is the Davidic covenant, where God promises to King David that he will establish his kingdom forever. And he will do that through David's descendant, whom the Lord says, he will be my son. I will be a father to him and he will be my son. The second passage is Psalm 2, another messianic psalm, where God declares to the Messiah, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The Messiah in the Old Testament is prophesied to be the Son of God. And so this term, Son of God, declares that Jesus is the Messiah. More than that, it declares that Jesus is divine, that He is is deity. And we'll see that as we work through the Gospel. John chapter 5, verse 18 is, is where it's made most clear. It says this is why the Jews were seeking to kill Jesus, because not only was He breaking the Sabbath, but He was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. To be the son of God is to be of the same essence, to be of the same nature as God. And though the religious leaders of that day refused to accept that the Messiah would be divine, as a true prophet here, John declares that this is precisely the case. And and Jesus, this, this man who is, Standing here in front of us, Jesus is the divine Messiah. Remember how John began his gospel back in verse 1 of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Before Jesus heals one person, before Jesus performs one miracle, before he does anything that reveals that he is truly God and truly man, John the prophet declares that Jesus is God. Well, with this, the star witness steps down from the witness stand. And the first proof of the Apostle John's case comes to an end. We've now heard the expert eyewitness, a a prophet who received direct revelation from God, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, that Jesus existed before John, that Jesus is the inaugurator of the new covenant, and that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, it would not be difficult to prove John wrong. If Jesus lived like any other man, if he taught what everybody else taught, if he could only do what everybody else could do, if he suffered and died like everybody else, never to be seen or heard from again, John would prove to be a false prophet and his testimony would prove to be perjury. But the next three years of Jesus' life and ministry, 
his teaching and his miracles and then his death and resurrection and ascension only prove that John was a true prophet and his testimony must be heard. What will you do with that testimony? If you have not believed in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, will you keep rejecting that truth? Or will you believe? If, if you're hesitating or if you're resisting, why? Do you not trust this testimony, which has proven itself in history? Is there some love of sin in your own life that's keeping you from submitting to Jesus? Do, do you need more evidence? Well, I would tell you that many throughout history, in fact, most of us in this room have believed this testimony and we have trusted in Jesus. And as a result, we have had our sins taken away and we can affirm to you that, yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We've found forgiveness in Jesus who gave his life to save sinners. You know, Jesus forgives murderers rapists, terrorists. He forgives liars and thieves and those who are sexually immoral. He forgives abusers and addicts and gangsters. And believe it or not, He even forgives homeschool moms <laughs> and hardworking dads and compliant children. Jesus forgives the young and the old, the rich and the poor. He forgives people from every tribe, from every nation, every ethnicity. And Jesus saves and forgives every sinner who comes to him in faith, believing that he is the Son of God and, and trusting in what he did as the Messiah, hanging on the cross, taking the penalty for sinners, and then rising from the dead. Believe in Him and you can be saved and have your sins taken away. Now most of us, like I said at the beginning, have come into this room already believing in Jesus, already having had our sins taken away. And to you and me, this testimony of John raises this question. If you really believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world... What hinders you and me from joining the chorus of witnesses to proclaim this message to others? Whatever answer comes to your mind as you think about that, you know that as one who's been baptized by the Holy Spirit, you have the very power of God dwelling within you. And you have the Word of God in your hands. So there's nothing we lack except perhaps the boldness of John the Baptist. But you know what made John bold? It's just this. He believed that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's no greater news. There's no more important news. There's, there's nothing more loving than to clearly and faithfully tell a sinner you can have your sins taken away. You can be forgiven. Because of what Jesus has done for us, let us join that great cloud of witnesses and have the boldness and be unashamed to speak of our Lord Jesus Christ to those who are lost in this world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this faithful testimony of this faithful prophet. We thank you that you spoke through him, that you revealed the truth to him, and that testimony now comes to us. Lord, I pray that if there would be any among us who would need Christ still in their lives, that you would open their eyes, that you would grant them the knowledge of Christ, that they would see their sin, and that they would trust in Jesus as the forgiver of sin. And as well, Lord, I pray that you would help us, each one of us individually, and then all of us together as Hope Bible Church, to be a church that faithfully proclaims the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world. Lord, help us not to shrink back, not to be afraid, 
Help us to be bold. Help us to be wise. Help us to be creative. Help us to be faithful witnesses for Christ so that we might see more sinners saved and added to the chorus of those who proclaim your greatness. We ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.